Oh, this one. Oh, yes, there you are. Um, Good morning, everybody. Hello. I'm Elysia Bus. I'm the host of Horsepower Empowerment Through Connection. And I am live here today with Claire Frost from Reading, England. And we have such a treat. So, Claire has invented equine breathing. You're like, what? But horses already breathe without us. You're right. They do. But like all things that in life, sometimes we can use a little extra help. And just like we got to talk to Tim Snell about somatic breathing um, earlier last week, that was last week, right guys? Ladies and gentlemen, the time just like passes so quickly. We get to talk about how Claire Frost can help us learn about how to help our horses to breathe more properly. So Claire, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate your time. And not only does she do to do this, she has a background in as a biologist and wildlife conservationalist. This is well, so it's very, a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. So Claire, what brought you to um, feeling like there was a need to invent equine breathing as a modality? Uh, well, that's a long story. Do you want me to explain that story first, or would you like me to explain what equine breathing is first? Oh, that's a tough question. I think it would make more sense if I explain what equine breathing is first. Whatever you think is best. Okay, yeah. off you are the expert. Well, um, well, because equine breathing is sort of different, uh, you know, sometimes people have no idea what it encompasses or anything so i think if i outline to begin with that might help so basically equine breathing is a natural and holistic method that enables owners to help their horses recover from chronic ailments such as um, um, sweet itch and uh, asthma and behavioral problems such as cribbing and wind sucking um, uh, so that basically they recover and um, it's something that anyone can do all they need to do is get hold of the free instructions which are on on the internet and anyone can do it with their horse and it's enjoyable for the horses and uh, you know it it's uh, it's something that they can do to help um, now equine breathing is about the horse recovering uh, by healing itself. And that is obviously um, known as holistic healing. Yes. And this is very, very different from the conventional view, which is um, uh, you know, a very careful analysis of symptoms and diagnosis, and then management or control of the symptoms with drugs and treatments and so on. Whereas equine breathing is very different um, because it's about enabling the horse to heal itself. So actually, um, the uh, well, first I should say equine breathing is not a veterinary technique and it's not a substitute for veterinary help. I should always, I it's always say that. <laughs> it's important for people to understand that. Um, but... Um, yeah, it's about, um, uh, if, you, if you think about using drugs uh, for anything, like let's say for asthma, if you use drugs to manage the symptoms of asthma, no one thinks that you're curing the asthma. Oh, you don't cure yeah. the asthma, you know, the asthma will just, if you stop using the drugs, the asthma will come back. Whereas with equine breathing, it's about enabling the horse to improve their health to the point where their, their physiology is no longer so compromised that it causes symptoms. And beyond that, obviously, uh, up to, to the point of full health. Um, so, you know, I, it's- I, I flipped it over to your page. <laughs> oh, right, thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. I was like, ah, she's busy explaining. I'm, go I'm going to do this for her. <laughs> Yeah, go well, on. <laughs> thank you very much. That's very kind because I was at a loss. But it's just okay. to say so that it, so equine breathing, and this is something that people find quite difficult. Equine breathing is not involved with or affected by diagnosis. 
so the symptoms are not actually really important to equine breathing so you can start by saying is the horse well or does the horse have symptoms if the horse has symptoms then it's worth doing equine breathing actually equine breathing is a fitness training as well because so it's can, about creating more balanced breath um, within the body yes balance is a very important part of it but also um well i'll come on to that in a minute if i may uh, but anyway, uh, so even if, you, if your horse has no symptoms, it's still worth doing equine breathing if you want to improve their performance, especially if you compete yeah. or, or do trail riding. You know, if you want to increase their stamina, uh, it, it's worth doing from that point of view. Um, so the, the basic premise of equine breathing is that um, it is the connection between breathing and health and this is not a, what's the word ya ya or ya oh, woo 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 that's right <laughs> it's not woo woo there there is a fact because um over breathing has a direct and biochemical effect on the physiology it damages the physiology now over breathing is very very common and it's not good and unfortunately we're all used to seeing over breathing in horses and in people interesting so equine breathing is actually what not what people expect but it's about reducing this over breathing because the over breathing is so directly damaging so what happened was uh, in the 1950s a russian professor called professor buteko uh, was a doctor um, he was working in a geriatric hospital and he noticed that uh, as the patients um, got nearer to death they breathed more and more so their breathing increased and this this connection was so specific that he could predict precisely when they were going to die by the amount of increase of their breathing fascinating so um you know he was sort of quite interested in this but then he got an acute form of um high blood pressure hypertension which um is fatal quite quickly and he thought hmm you know if the breathing increases as you get nearer to death if you reduce the breathing back down towards normal can you reverse the symptoms and that's what he did he he taught himself to reduce the breathing and he recovered from the he went on to live for 40 years or whatever it was oh, um, so he invented what's called buteco breathing and uh, he realized that this relationship between breathing and health was absolutely direct he if if a person is ill then they over breathe in 50 years of practicing helping people with the buteco breathing he never found an exception to this mm. rule so now you can see why if a horse is over breathing if you help them to train their breathing back down to normal this enables them to recover is anybody else out there like paying attention to your breathing right now? Because I definitely find that I'm right now like, how am I breathing? <laughs> it can make people it can make people very stressed when they start to think about their breathing, and that's because breathing should be under the control of the parasympathetic nervous system. So it should be the diaphragm that's controlling the breathing. But what is much more common these days in the population is that we have sort of almost consciously overtaken the diaphragm and use other um, controls for our breathing which should not be working and they're not very good so that we end up breathing too much interesting so the body when the body 
when you start hearing that you're over breathing the body sort of goes oh you know oh dear panic 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 and um over oh, i'm getting into too much detail now but um that is the reason why equine breathing works because it's a direct link to the physiology through the respiration uh, biochemistry so you say that it has damaging effects. Like what would be some examples of diet, like damaging effects of overbreathing, especially within like within horses, if that's what we're focusing on. Okay, well, I was going to talk about those in more detail later, but just to say some examples. Bri briefly here and then we'll dive. Briefly, deeper. yes. Um, uh, head shaking, asthma, heaves, allergies, wind sucking, anxiety, um, separation anxiety, stress, uh, aggression, hormonal problems, um, sweet itch, did I say that? Uh, mud fever. Um, Fascinating. Really, when I come to explain a bit more about the physiology, it becomes more clear why all these things are affected. It's like a teaser so people continue watching for later. Sure, yeah, yeah, no, it's a good idea. <laughs> so, um, so yes, that was um, that was Buteco, and uh, it, people, you know, do find it hard to believe that there is this connection between breathing and health, um, because humans are naturally um, greedy. So humans tend to, which is a good is a good survival strategy, of course. Um, but humans tend to Sometimes, think that, not always. <laughs> well, you know, evolutionarily, it probably was, you know, oh, these berries are good, I'll eat lots of them while they're here, you know. Greetings, <laughs> <laughs> downfall of all things, but let's not get off subject. <laughs> well, so, you know, some people think that uh, deep breathing, breathing lots, I mean, it's very common for people to think that deep breathing is good for you. Mm. Um, and so, and they think that if oxygen is good for you, then more oxygen is, is better for you. So they think that, well, you know, in order to get more oxygen, I need to breathe more. But they're wrong on two counts. Firstly, they're wrong that oxygen, yeah, it's a super fuel. You know, if you combust oxygen, you get lots of energy. And that's what we do in our bodies. That's what gives us our energy. But it's a double-edged sword because oxygen is a nasty chemical. And in the body, you only have to look at the market for antioxidants. You know, we're always being told to eat things like blueberries, you know, because they've got antioxidant proper properties to protect us from the oxygen, the effects of oxygen in, in our bodies. So it's a double-edged sword, but in addition to that, actually, you don't get more oxygen if you breathe more air. That's a complete fallacy. Now, I'm going to suggest to you a little thought game. I'm like, scientifically, so we're talking to a scientist now, ladies and gentlemen, so you have to break that down a little bit more for people, I think, because if people are like, say what? Like, oxygen isn't good for us? I think you're going to have to... <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm going to ask you to all, you know, viewers and Alicia, yes. to do a little mind experiment. Okay. So I want you to just imagine that you're taking bigger and bigger, deeper and deeper breaths, rapid and rapid, deep breaths. You don't have to do it. Just imagine taking very, very quick, deep breaths, getting as much air through your lungs as you can. Right. And then you get lightheaded and like feel like you're going to pass out. And that's why people tell you to regulate your breathing when you're, and they hand you a paper bag, right? Exactly. Exactly. Now the lightheaded, the dizziness, lightheadedness, the fainting, you could even faint, is, are all signs of lack of oxygen in the brain. Yeah. So is it like... It's like you can only assimilate so much at one time sort of situation? No, no, it's, um, it's much more elegant than that. It's, it's that the amount of oxygen that you can take into your body is governed by carbon dioxide. Now, I can explain about this now, 
uh, or we can go we can do it further on when we talk about the physiology let's dive in a little bit deeper right now and then you can do more later okay we'll just, we'll just uh, find the flow i feel like when people are in a headspace they're like thinking about it let's just go a little yeah. bit right now. okay so carbon dioxide is one of the body's main regulators it's been labeled as a waste gas which is ridiculous uh it you know there's no evidence for that whatsoever um it is produced by the cells that's true and it carbon dioxide is needed for a whole raft of physiological functions but if i talk about one to begin with you'll start to see the importance of it when the air comes into the lungs it's got oxygen in it um, the only way the air can get the oxygen can get into the blood that's in the little air sacs in the, in the lungs is by exchanging carbon dioxide from the blood for oxygen so you have to have enough carbon dioxide on the blood to exchange it for the oxygen plus so you get this nice oxygenated blood going mm. around your body <clears throat> you need carbon dioxide at the cells to enable the hemoglobin the oxyhemoglobin you asked for science i love science i love it <laughs> give me more you need, you need the um oxyhem you, you need the blood the oxyhemoglobin in the blood requires carbon dioxide to release the oxygen to the cell so that the cell can then use the the oxygen for um respiration for provide for, for producing energy okay so that's why if you, i haven't fully quite explained yet because what happens is uh, we require carbon dioxide in our bodies at a much much higher level than what is in the air like in the order of 200 times oh wow Oh yeah, we, we, we really need carbon dioxide in our bodies. So um, the lungs, it, when you take air into the lungs, carbon dioxide is sucked out of the body into the air in the lungs because a gas will diffuse in, from high concentrations to low con concentrations. So then when you breathe out the air, you lose carbon dioxide. Okay, so that um, that's fine, no problem there, because the trees need it. <laughs> Sorry, I said the trees need it. Well, yeah, but um, <laughs> we need it, but that's fine because <laughs> keep a grip, Alicia. We're getting <laughs> the important, important point here. So that's good. fine because the cells <laughs> create carbon dioxide as a byproduct of oxidative respiration. So, so long as there's enough carbon dioxide in the body to allow the oxygen to the cells, the cells will respire the oxygen and create carbon dioxide and water, both of which are very essential to the body. Yeah. But, but wait, there's more. Breathe, if you breathe more, you take bigger amounts into your lungs, more carbon dioxide diffuses out of your body. And because um, Overbreathing tends to be a chronic habit, it becomes a chronic habit. Over time, you, your carbon dioxide levels in your body go down. Producing so different then, symptoms in the body. Yeah, exactly. And also, you, um, it makes you feel uh, breathless because it's more difficult to get the oxygen into the body. And not the good kind of breath, breathless, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> so that stimulates you to breathe even more, which is the wrong thing to do. So um, Professor Buteyko, he developed this, um, these exercises for people to learn. Obviously, he would explain to them first, look, the reason you've got um, heart disease or, uh, you know, um emphysema or whatever it is is because you're breathing too much and he would explain to them you have to reduce your breathing 
and and he 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 devised these very simple exercises, but they do need a bit of um, help for for most people to to do them right. Um, so which they do regularly every day, you know, several times a day to gradually change the respiratory driver, which is calibrated to making you breathe too much, to get used to breathing less and less. And that's when you start to heal. Now, obviously, um, I couldn't do that with horses. So going back to uh, what I <laughs> didn't answer earlier, which is why did I think I should do it with horses? Why should you invent equine breathing? <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, well, um, you know, when I was 20, I had a bad motorcycle accident. Uh, one of the things that happened was that um, I lost my spleen. Oh, wow. And uh, I then got, um, uh, you know, a, a nasty infection, a polio type virus. Oh. Um, and for 15 years, I got iller and iller couldn't do very much at all. Uh, the last two years I was bedridden for two years. Oh. And um, I just kept thinking, you know, there must be something I can do. And uh, I just came across, it was very lucky because I, I wasn't reading anything, you know, computers weren't very, there was no internet then as, as there was now. Um, and I came across this book, uh, well, I, I bought this book, um, by mail order uh, on the Buteco method and I read about it and when I first uh, tried it my breathing was so bad I was so off the scale I thought oh this is rubbish this can't be right so I, I, I ignored it but you know I continued to be bedridden and um, you know things were sort of getting bad so I tried again and I, I was one of these people, my breathing was so bad that it made me panic to try and improve it. So yeah. it was very hard for me. Well, it turned out that one of Buteyko's, it was like a sort of stepson of Buteyko, was um, a few miles down the road in England for, for a brief time. And uh, I rang him and he said, I asked him some questions. He said, oh, just come. It'll make you better. <laughs> so I got my husband the to take me. of the ask. I learned Buteyko. And uh, I was so, imp I mean, I got better. You know, it was sort of quite incredible. When I first started doing the exercises, my husband said to me that he knew it, would, it was working because I used to be sort of yellow and green and, and gray, you know, lack of blood you see lack yeah. of circulation and um when i did the exercises i went pink <laughs> so um i i as my health returned and everything i decided to train as a buteco practitioner and at the time i had three horses and my oldest horse was in his mid-20s amazing um thoroughbred who'd come over from ireland very damaged mm. he'd obviously had some sort of very bad accident he had all scars and everything um but he was you know he's an amazing horse and um he started head shaking uh, when he was in his early 20s and it got uh, extremely violent i mean you couldn't put a halter on you know it was extremely violent he was in deep distress and uh, my vet, who's a homeopathic vet, we tried lots of different remedies um, and eventually found one that helped a bit so that I didn't have to have him euthanized. Right. Um, it, you know, he was coping. And uh, I was out doing the horses one day and I was watching him and he was massively over breathing. His respiration rate was down to about nine. People think that's good, but he was taking these massive deep breaths, you know, very infrequently. So I thought, okay, well, here we are then. I can help him. 
obviously I couldn't explain to him that he was over breathing and he had to do his exercises, you know. Come on now, buddy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I thought, well, I'll just have to do it to him. Yeah. So that's how I came up with the, the one end method. And um, basically, I mean, it was quite, it was quite frightening to begin with because in the first few sessions, it seemed to make him worse. But luckily, I knew enough from the Buteco training to understand that, that was the body's resistance of coming out the really bad um, equilibrium it was in. And then he recovered. And, uh, you know, at his age, he was mid-20s by then, late 20s, he recovered. And, I mean, he, he, he was just, he was like a jack-in-a-box. You know, he had so much energy, he just used to bounce around the place. <laughs> you know. And no more head-taking. Um, no more head shaking and and uh, also all sorts of other things that he had problems with like receding gums arthritis um i can't remember a whole load of other things he had Fascinating. Oh, he, used get, he used to get recurring fevers you know all those sorts of things just i mean he was healthier than he'd ever been and so i thought well my goodness you know i'll have to share this and so that's how i mean you know, I, I sort of made a website, not a very good one, but um, start I started somewhere. sharing it and, um, you know, learnt as we went along. Um, but that is how uh, Corain was the horse that basically was my co-founder of Equine Breathing. I love it. Is he on your website? Are there pictures of him on your website? Yes. Yes. Not many, because in those days, I didn't even have a camera or a video camera. Um, so there are some pictures of him, you know, when he was better. Not, not really. I didn't have really pictures of him when he was head shaking. But um, so that was, uh, that was good. And uh, in the early days, um, what was amazing was I, I worked on some horses um, that were... Uh, that there was a head shaker called Curry. Um, his owner is a lovely, gentle, lovely, kind person who'd bought him in March in our spring. And basically, when I saw him, he was such a mess, such a mess. He had so much wrong with him. And she, she was not a very knowledgeable horse owner. She'd, she'd waited her entire life to have a horse. And she bought this horse and in April he started head shaking, which mm. he obviously probably had done other years. And so they sold him before the symptoms arose. And um, so I worked with her and he was, this is a great example of what happened in the early days. He had all sorts of problems, like he was very itchy. He had terrible separation anxiety. She couldn't get him out the field, you know, it, it was so difficult. Um, he had a phobia about his ears. He couldn't have his ears touched. He had a recurring abscess in his throat, which uh, had repeated antibiotics and then it would come back again. He had about 50 injuries on his body where he had been scraped in the field and they hadn't healed properly. Wow. Um, he, had, uh, oh, he had a bowed tendon, which was bald and badly bowed and, uh, you know, um, so we, we worked with him and, uh, the head shaking, well, yeah, that disappeared quite quickly actually. Um, and, but so did these other things, these other things also resolved and, you know, it, it, there were several of these cases early on and I thought, God, because I, I knew they, they, they should do, but when you see a horse actually doing holistic healing, because you're putting the right mix of fuel in them, you know, the right air. Um, it's a sort of, it's mind blowing. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Do you get testimonials from people? Or like take any before and pick, after like yes. video or picture? Well, yes, or? Curry is on the um, website and uh, we do have before and after, I was a bit more organized by then, we do have before and after pictures. We have Julia talking about, you know, what she thought about it. Nice. Um, so there was one, there was one that I don't have pictures of, well, particularly, um, I think he was actually the second horse I worked on. He was a, a little pony 
at the Equestrian Centre. And he had very, very bad, who was run by a friend of mine. And I said, have you got any horses I can, you know, try out my yeah. breathing yeah. And um, he had very bad three ditch and he used to rub his, his chest and his uh, tummy raw and his sheath was massively swollen. He had no mane, mm. you know, it, 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 it was so sad. And I went and did equine breathing with him and I was hoping that someone would, uh, that one of the staff would do it, but no one, as I said, you know, people don't believe that it works. So they, that's fair enough. I didn't know, I couldn't say that it would work for, for sure you know because I hadn't done a sweet itch yet and um so I used to go sort of once a week I think which I didn't think would be enough but actually it was and he did recover from wow. sweet itch and he I do have on the website uh, a picture of his breathing which has returned to normal and I'm so proud of that because it was so lovely um but the reason I bring him up was that um there was a a nine-year-old boy there who had um, learning difficulties and um, I'd never spoken to him before I mean I, I knew he was the son of one of the staff and I was working on coloured one day and he came up and he said I'm very pleased you're working on coloured because I like stroking him and um, when I stroke him normally his neck's cold and hard and after you've been it's warm and soft Oh, wow, that's and really that cool. was stunning to me because that would be the effect of the carbon dioxide softening the muscles and opening the um, peripheral blood vessels huh. and for that to come from this lad and what was so exciting about that I mean I was I was stunned at the time but so often now when I work with people people are so in the sort of conventional view that you look at the symptoms so they say to me okay i'm going to do a crime breathing how soon will the symptoms disappear you know uh, uh, when you know will the when will the coughing stop and it's very difficult you i, I can't say because it, it's completely individual to the horse each ho sure. horse has their own healing process but also because coughing for example is part of the healing process and it has a different significance once the horse is healing than when the horse is stuck in a vicious cycle of chronic illness it's quite different but the thing is what a lot of people have to learn to do is what that little boy did which is to recognize something good happening in the horse aside from the absence of something bad Yes, and, and that we don't know, there's no point trying to understand what the horse is doing with the symptoms because it's too complicated. So we have to look for things that make us realise that the horse is doing better. Like the softening is, of the muscles. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, you would know how important that is. I do. <laughs> As a massage therapist. <laughs> And then there was one other um, uh, notable uh, success, um, which is on the website, which is a little pony called Ben. And um, he was a rescue pony and was bought by this elderly lady. She rescued several ponies. She had a field and she rescued several ponies and she was quite elderly. And um, Ben uh, had, I don't, had, I don't know when he developed it, but for two years he had had, um, uh, COPD uh, couldn't breathe and one of the good things about that was that um, his vet recommended equine breathing and the other thing was that uh, his the, the uh, well it's not a good thing the owner now the, the elderly lady was too ill to look after him so her lovely husband uh, who was not in the best health himself um, was looking after the ponies and uh, but he was willing to do equine breathing not one in because you know that was a bit much to ask but i gave him a breather and um ben uh, not only recovered from the copd but um you know he lost weight and and he gained energy and everything and i was so pleased about that because the husband the the ponies weren't the husbands 
priority, you know. I mean, they weren't his passion like they were for the wife. What um, a good partner that he was willing to step in and, and exactly. do that for both his wife and for the families. Yes. And I was so pleased that equine breathing was up to being used like that. Yeah. Because obviously a lot of people, I, I think by far, almost all the people that do equine breathing are very, very passionate about their horses. But the people who do equine breathing do it because they're passionate about their horses. It is a, it, it's a pioneer market at the moment. Yeah. Because it's difficult for people to understand and it's scary. It's not conventional. You can't ask your mate, oh, you know, when you started one end, did your horse cough? Because your mate has never heard of equine breathing. Um, so, Which is why we're here today to increase exactly. visibility and understanding yes. of what it is that you do and how it can help horses because we're here to help the horses as well as the people. <laughs> That's why I'm so pleased with this opportunity. Thank you. And interesting. So um, I'm curious, have you noticed any correlations between the horses breathing and the owners or the people riding them? Like if one affects the other or vice versa? Yes. Um, now, it's, it is well known that it, with humans, if you have a group of humans, they are affected by the worst breather. So if you have someone that's breathing badly in the group, it will make other people breathe badly or worse than they do. I mean, if someone has good breathing, um, I don't know why I'm putting my hand up. If someone has good breathing, it will only Because raise... good is like up here, right? <laughs> yeah. No but, no, but I mean, we don't want increased breathing. We want reduced breathing. We want good, healthy, healthy breathing. Yes, it will only go up that much. But if someone's breathing is already bad, it'll go up even further because it's already higher. So um, yes, absolutely. And a lot of what I teach is I always say to people, don't talk to your horse because talking, most people, if they over breathe, talking exacerbates that. And sometimes, I don't know if you come across this, but you hear people talking to their horse in a high pitched voice and a very excitable manner even though they think they're calming the horse down. Yeah, people um, oftentimes don't pay attention to the, um, the tone that they're using and the, um, like the energetic frequencies that go with the different tones. Um, but even just the act of, if you over breathe, the act of talking, I, I've done this on using a capnometer to measure the amount of carbon dioxide that is being expelled from the lungs. And um, the, the carbon dioxide will go down when people start talking. That's interesting. Yeah, I think about sing how singers train and how breath is expelled for the different um, ways that they sing, the different notes and whatnot. Well, the thing about singers is that um, mostly, um, they take an in-breath and then the out-breath is prolonged, isn't it? You know, it's longer than it would be if they were just breathing normally. And that allows carbon dioxide to build up in the body because all the time that you're going, mm, your cells continue to metabolize and produce carbon dioxide. And in fact, it's one of my, my pet loves is humming. Because anyone, even if people are scared of changing their breathing, mostly people don't mind humming. So if you hum with your mouth shut, like I just did, mm -hmm. that can improve your breathing. It will improve your breathing. Interesting. I feel like I just want to get a whole bunch of breathwork practitioners on a panel with you and just have like this giant, like nerding no, out no, conversation no. of like. No, no, because, um, uh, you know, look, I was, I was teaching, sometimes I get people, uh, owners of horses that see the improvement in their horses and they say, will you teach me? And I don't do it very often because I don't work locally so much now. I work mostly through the internet, but 
in the early days, I had a lady who had seen the improvement. She had a windsucker, um, an, an event horse, and she was so pleased with the results, she wanted to do the breathing herself. And her partner uh, was a um, ex-professional French tennis player. And when he stopped playing professional tennis, he developed very, very bad sinusitis. And it was so bad that uh, the pain was so bad that he couldn't eat French food anymore because something in the French food made the sinusitis flare up. Mm -hmm. So um, he came along to my workshop and, um, you know, I, I, we did what we do in the workshop. And at one point he said, but, you know, you're telling me to do the opposite of what the physio for the French tennis players team taught me to do. Well, what can I say? I'm not an expert. I'm not a physio, but he got better. Yeah. So, no, I don't, I, I, I wouldn't argue with any respiratory person. And, oh, uh, no, it's not about, it's not about arguing. I don't promote arguing. It's about um, creating a safe containers always to communicate about what a person's experience is. That's a beautiful thing about what we're trying to um, create. It's, it's fine to not want to do it. I don't have any problem with that. No, um, I, I understand, but I, I have, to, you know, from 20 years of doing equine breathing, I have to tell you. That years, that's a long time. That's so I awesome. Know. Yeah, well, most people, um, let's say, there's two examples to give you. One is that, uh, you know, I've had horses that were, had been, the vets had said they should be euthanized because of their, I'm thinking of one was a head shaker, an event horse head shaker. And the lady had spent thousands of pounds on, you know, treatments and things. And the vet said, no, you just have to have her put down. And she did a crime breathing and uh, she was able to, you know, the head shaking stopped and she was able to compete again. She was in a yard where there were other horses, which head, sh head shaped, you know, um, had, I can't remember the details now, it's quite a long time ago, but there were other horses that would have benefited from equine breathing. They'd seen this, this mare recover. Did they do equine breathing? Were they the slightest bit interested? No. And I'll tell you another thing is that I have, um, various Facebook support groups for people who uh, want to use equine breathing, for example, for um, wind sucking and cribbing or head shaking, uh, COPD asthma, whatever it is. And uh, I find that people join the group and then they get all excited and they, they um, join, they, they uh, invite one of their friends or some of, some of their friends sometimes to join the group as well. And I always leave it for a day or so because almost without exception, those people don't want to join the group. I have found that with equine breathing, people have to find it themselves. For the, they have to find it for themselves. It's like you, you, you saw my profile I, like, oh, I did. It was it was yeah. so funny. It was just the um the algorithm of Facebook recommending different friends and um and so I found it. And that's the thing is that people have to be true to themselves. And if they have an open mind and they want to look at something, like they can explore it and it may or may not indicate to them in honoring that process and that they'll be pulled into different practitioners that um that they resonate with. And that's it's fine with it. That's why I like to present so many different models and not say that one is better than another because it's yeah. about people um, connecting with other people and their own personal journey and that the practitioner's own personal journey and being able to communicate things in a way um, that people feel seen and heard and understood because with multiple intelligence theory, like you could have two people that actually agree on something, but because of the way that they assimilate information and communicate it outwardsly, and they, they will actually argue about a point that they actually agree on because they're not able to communicate in a way that the other person understands. Um, yes, I mean, but I think you can see why my philosophy is to make the information available. 
Absolutely. Isn't, there, isn't it free on your website? Is that right? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, anyone, anyone can start equine breathing totally for free. And I give advice for free. Um, I'm on the groups all the time. It's you very know, generous helping. of you. Well, you know, um, I'm very lucky that my husband had a good job. He's retired now, but um, he's always supported me financially and he supported me. What a gift. Through uh, everything, emotionally, everything. With uh, he, he thinks it's wonderful to be that I've been able to indulge my passion, which is to help horses. I'm like you. I just want to help horses in the world. And I, I, I've always wanted to do that before I ever had the idea of <laughs> equine breathing, you know. And so I'm so, so lucky. So it's, it's, just, um, it's, just, it's just a joy and a pleasure to help people. Um, you know, because the thing is, equine breathing does work. I wouldn't want to do it if it, if it didn't work or, you know. Um, yeah. I understand. I'm not a salesman. No, but, I mean, you didn't contact me to promote yourself. Like, I reached out to you to be like, you know, I'm breathing. What is that? Like, let's talk about it in front of the public and be like, hey, ladies and gentlemen, like, look at this over here. Yes, what but it's not think? something that happens to me very, very frequently, I must say. It's quite unusual <laughs> approach. You don't get approached very frequently? Hey, you know, maybe this will, that'll change after this interview. You never yeah, know. Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, my friend, can you walk us through the process of equine breathing? Yes. Okay. Um, the first thing I say to people, people say to me, uh, you know, they, they, they find equine breathing and then they start talking about the symptoms and everything. Mm -hmm. Well, as I say, the symptoms don't really matter. So the most important thing is to get started. Right. And uh, we have the, um, the instructions for the one nostril, which is the basic technique, uh, the most simple and basic technique. And there are instructions and video, uh, written instructions and videos on the website. So they can read those. And then basically it's what you're doing really is just covering one nostril. It, it sounds so simple. But of That's course, something it, they do in yoga too. Like they'll do the different yeah. breathing. Yeah, some people do recognize it from yoga. It's slightly different because humans tend to breathe through one nostril at a time anyway. Um, horses do. That's like news to me. <laughs> yes, apparently. Uh, I, I don't know much about it, but uh, that's what I'm told by the Buteco practitioners. Um, but horses, they can have sometimes one nostril is blocked and that mm. the same thing happens with humans it's it's sort of a well the Piteco people say it's um it, it's a defense against over breathing you know people get polyps in their nose what? yeah and they they go and have them removed and the Buteco people think oh no because they will grow back what you have to do is reduce the over breathing and then the polyps disappear by themselves you don't need surgery oh. so it's a, it's a bit i don't know what happens with the horse as i say i don't get involved with the with the minutiae mm. of, of what happens in a horse's nose but it's it's quite it's not uncommon for a horse to have one nostril which is quite blocked so you you basically do 30 minutes a day which can be um you do five minutes one nostril five minutes the other nostril and you can do that three times in one go, or you can do it before you ride and after you ride, in the morning, late morning, whenever. And what I say to people is do it for a week. And after a week, I would expect them to see some sort of improvement. Now, often it is a reduction of the symptoms, but it's not necessarily, sometimes it, we go back to colored with this warm neck, uh -huh. sometimes it'll just be something that is better yeah because we can't direct it well we can't really direct the um the healing process to, to, to do what we want i mean say a horse is lame yeah. and the owner wants the horse to not be lame anymore well we can't <laughs> Please stop being lame. yeah well we can't the breathing will help but in the horse's own time 
so the horse might heal other things before they get on to or completing the healing of the lameness right. and that's that's another problem is that um you know that the, the person might have to be uh willing to wait before they start riding again if they were using drugs to mask symptoms yeah then you know when the horse starts healing again uh, when the horse starts healing sorry um the you know they for example the airways can become vulnerable because they're very active because they're healing yeah uh, when I was doing my buteco, my lungs became, I had uh, pneumonia twice when I was a toddler and my lungs were That's scarred. And uh, <laughs> yeah, they, when I started doing the buteco, my lungs became extremely painful because they were healing. And that, you know, Holistic healing is not all nice and magic and airy fairy and, and lovely. It's hard blooming work, you know, and the body has to do things which are difficult sometimes. It takes energy to repair the body. It so sometimes energy. you're actually more tired when you're in repair mode than uh, Absolutely. And, and, and sometimes it will go both ways. Sometimes the horse will be tired, but it's usually for a short period. But other times they have lots of energy, but they're coughing. And you know, people can't understand this, you know, but he's coughing again. Yes, because he's mending the cells in the airway, which is creating uh, waste products, which are coming into the, into the mucus, which is coming up out of the airways and has to be coughed out. Doesn't mean they're getting worse, especially mm -hmm. when their energy is good. Yeah. So holistic healing, uh, the, doing the one end, you know, I explained it all and it sounds very simple. And it is. It's a very simple technique, but oh my goodness, what happens when you do one in is not simple. You do get some horses that just go, oh, one in, lovely, they fall asleep. <laughs> they, you know, it's very soothing, you see, um, yeah. one in. That's the carbon dioxide um, and the adrenaline. I haven't mentioned about adrenaline, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, but you know, and they, they gradually get better and better and the symptoms disappear and that's fine. And, and the only goes, Oh, great. You know, but more often, you know, strange things happen when they're healing and, you know, as I say, because equine breathing is not well known, you know, if, if the person doing it could say to another person or, or in the barn, Oh, did you get this when you were doing when you were first starting? And they say, Oh yeah, you know, got through it and he was so much better afterwards. That's not really available to most people. So um, that's why I make myself available as much. I always say to people, ask me, ask me, because the techniques are, are simple. Um, if you do one end for a week and you find that it's being effective, but say you don't have time to do the one end 30 minutes a day. Um, then you can buy a breather, which is a more effective way of doing it. Um, but I don't, I prefer people to have done one in so that they can see the effect before they spend any money. And which I is, fan say which is fantastic. I am, I'm realizing this doesn't happen to me very often that I am booked really tight. And so I'm running, I'm burning very close to time that I've realized um so there's a lot of really beautiful information here um ah somebody who was kind and uh just bought us 15 more minutes the person i'm supposed to talk to next i i reached out and i was like i'm in a nervous <laughs> thank you very kindly uh um, so for that like i said that's perfect actually i love it when things synchronistically um match up synchronistically that's such a funny word. I'm like, did I say it right? Oh, so you know, how some, some words you yeah. just kind of trip over uh, in life. So um, there, so we can dive into a little bit more. So after we do our recording today, um, everyone, I'll be posting it up on YouTube and I'll have her website out for you and you'll be able to talk to her if you have any further questions and get to dive deeper into what it is that she does and 
how she could help you with your course. Um, if you have any questions there, she does this work virtually, right, Claire? Absolutely. Yeah. You can connect and virtually. If I could, if I could just say that the, the most important thing really is for the person to try the one in for themselves. That's really the, the sort of crux of it. You know, you don't have to do lots of reading about how it works. It doesn't matter how it works. Just go out and try it with your own horse. Yeah, do the connection work. Do connection work. And, and then just get to have that moment and just standing there in a relaxed way, um, just holding your one hand over the one nostril, correct? That's um, right, for, yeah. For five minutes and time it. And you can even work on your own breathing while you're, work, you're working on your that, horse's breathing. Thank you. That's exactly what I say to people. Because, you know, like most of us can use a little bit extra work on our own breathing. And it also helps us to connect with our horses on a deeper level when we breathe with them. Um, it's a really beautiful thing. And it helps with emotional regulation for us as well. And when we're in a more regulated state, then we're able to um, more clearly communicate to our horses what it is that we want to do with them. The horses feel safer um, because we're in congruence. Um, in our internal world and our external world. Um, and there are just lots of positive results from that experience and working in alignment. Claire, um, so this is just like a labor of love. This isn't something that you make any money off of. Is that no, it, it covers its expenses, but um, no, it's not. I, I, I'm very lucky that I don't have to make money out of it. You know, it's something I do because I want to help horses. That's beautiful. What a gift. What a gift you are to the world, Claire. Such a privilege. I mean, you know, I'm just so lucky. Yeah, well, that makes my heart happy. And I'm just Can I, make... Have you got time to hear about adrenaline? Yes, we do. We have time. We were gifted some more time from the person that I was supposed to talk to next. I'm very excited to talk to my next person too. She's doing like all kinds of amazing things in the world, but I'm going to be selfish. I'm keeping that one to myself. Uh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, you'll have to wait for that interview for later, first 30 minutes. <laughs> yes, adrenaline. Okay, so um, it, it, the reason that um, over-breathing is, is, is bad is because, um, I explained two reasons. One is that carbon dioxide levels fall and carbon dioxide is absolutely essential for the body, um, for getting oxygen into the body, also for maintaining the correct pH, the acid alkaline balance. And that's something because that affects the interst interstitial fluid, the fluid between the cells. So if the acid alkaline balance is not being looked after by the carbon dioxide uh, that can affect all the cells in the entire body and that's how uh, you know improving the breathing can affect such a wide range of symptoms that's one of the reasons um, and there are other reasons that the carbon dioxide uh, other functions that the carbon dioxide has that mean that it's very important to allow the carbon dioxide levels to build back up by reducing the breathing. But apart from carbon dioxide, uh, there is another connection, which is that um, breathing and adrenaline uh, heart rate are linked. So um, if there's a stimulus, like a lion appears, and the horse has to run away, obviously they get a big boost of adrenaline and the adrenaline works on the heart rate and the breathing to increase them, okay? So that's great because then the horse runs away, uh, hopefully escapes from the lion, and um, in running away has increased the carbon dioxide because the cells are all having to work, the muscle cells are working harder. Right. Um, but what happens in domestic situations is that horses tend to get stuck in the adrenalized um, or oh, I'm, I'm rushing this, in, in, the, in, in the adrenalized flight or fight state because they chronically over-breathe. Interesting. So the over-breathing is keeping them in, a, in an adrenalized state. 
So it's very common for owners of horses that come to me for equine breathing tell me they've never seen their horse lie down. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because the horse is too adrenalized to lie down. Huh, fascinating. So um, that is uh, why if the horse is under any um, physiological or psychological stress or combination of the two, like, for example, being kept in an inactive in a stall, that is a physiological and a, a psychological stress because they're isolated and they're herd animals. So it's a physiological stress because um, a horse is not designed to be kept still. And so when they're inactive, they're not producing as much carbon dioxide and the effects of the stress can build up. So together you get a horse that's going into more of an adrenalized state. Now, some people think of the adrenalized state as being just all, you know, wide eyed and like, you know, wired and everything. But don't forget that adrenaline can also cause freeze state. So the horse might be shut down and depressed. So one of the things that uh, the equine breathing allows is that when you reduce the breathing, it allows the adrenaline to go down. And um, uh, often you'll find that the horse, because they've been on the upper drug, if you like, the, the um, speed, which right. is the adrenaline, for so long, they haven't had a, a chance to rest properly. So they're extremely tired. But also very, very important is that when the animal is in the flight or fight state, resources are channeled towards the muscles. And resources are not sent to increasing the immune um, cell system, so grown new cells, cell growth, cell maintenance, and cell repair. Those things are not dealt with adequately when the horse is in an adrenalized state and those things are what constitute healing so with equine breathing you lower the adrenaline um, by lowering the breathing and then the horse can go into the parasympathetic state where you get rest it's called rest and digest isn't it you know um <laughs> so, uh, you get the basically the, the, the functions that can, can go on, the, the normal functions that keep the body going. So that's what healing is about, is encouraging that um, parasympathetic state of uh, cell growth, maintenance and repair. That's really cool. Thank you so much for sharing all that. Like, gosh, like, what a download of information and wisdom today like, and generosity. This has been so amazing. Claire, thank you so much for everything that you have gifted me and the audience. I'm excited to try this on my own mare who um, chronically has struggled with Swedish since she came back to Washington State. She was fine in Oregon, uh, but she just really struggles uh, with Swedish here in Washington State, regardless of allergy medicine and different things that we have tried. So I'll keep you posted on how yes. this new modality of equine breathing helps my horse. So I'm excited. Yeah. Hopefully and thank you so much that. for giving me this opportunity. And it's you are a wonderful host, do I call you? Um, yes, thank you. It's lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much, Claire. I really appreciate that. It's uh, It's been fun. Thank All right, you. ladies and gentlemen, until next time, I'll see you later. Have a wonderful day. Bye. All right.